Sorry. So when we think about death and what occurred in the Garden of Eden, there is a physical death and a spiritual death. Now, when we define the word death, death simply means separation. Okay, death means separation. So what happens in physical death is our physical body is separated from our soul. That's what we call death. But what death is also occurring, spiritually speaking, is our soul, our spirit, is separated from our Creator, from our Heavenly Father. So when death brought, was brought upon us in judgment, it's, it's twofold because we are both soul and body. We're both spirit and physical. So the judgment was twofold. A separation from our body and our spirit and a separation of our spirits from our Creator God. And when I look at what Jesus did on the cross, what Jesus did on the cross was to take on both judgments. It was to experience defeat and then share the triumph with us over both judgments. When Jesus died, it was both physical and spiritual. All right, so when Jesus is on the cross, this is the Son of God, this is 100% God, 100% man, he died, meaning his physical body perished and was separated from his true self, his spirit, his soul. But also we read that for the first time in history, and I'm talking history eternal sense, the Father turns his back on the Son. There was a separation In the Trinity, the Father and the Son separated there on the cross. He suffered both judgments on our behalf. And Jesus begins to discuss what really was really occurring here. And when we talk about his discussion here, it's always it's always complicated, it's always difficult. All right, because he's here alive talking to his disciples, telling them what's about to occur. And he tells them a lot. He says, not only, listen, I'm going to suffer and die. I'm going to experience the wrath of God, the judgment of God. And I'm going to die, but I'm going to come back. I'm going to raise again, but then I'm going to leave again. I'm going to leave, and then I'm going to come back sometime in the future. And their head's just spinning like, what? You're di- How can you die? What do you mean? You're the Messiah. What? It was so confusing. It was really hard for them to understand. So Jesus tries to be very simplistic and basic and just trying to teach some general principles. What we ultimately get to experience from the cross is we get to experience now we are spiritually in line with God. We now see that kind of our debt's been paid. Spiritually speaking, we are united. And when we die, when this physical body is separated from our soul, our soul is going to be united with Christ. This is what occurred at his first coming. Jesus defeated both and accomplished both physically and spiritually, but now says to us, hey, I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back literally and physically. I'm going to return, and after that event, then you're going to be united physically again in your body. Now we'll be reunited both physically and spiritually, so death will be defeated on both counts. So we always know that any time he talks about the second coming, it's confusing, so let's get confused together. Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17 and we're going to be marching through the last portion of this passage. All right? This is um, in Luke 17, verse 22. And Jesus says to his disciples, Listen, the days will come when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man. And you will not see it. They will say to you, Look here, look here. Do not go away. Do not run after them. For just like the lightning, when it flashes out at one part of the sky, shines to the other parts of the sky, so will the Son of Man be in his day, come like a bolt of lightning. So here it is. This is the last, por- the last uh, message in this series, the weirdest things uh, that Jesus does and says in the book of Luke. So this is the last one we've covered, all right? And then we're going to get into the, um, the Passion account here beginning next week. But why it's so weird, why the the return of Christ is so weird, I think it's for three reasons. I think, number one, it's weird for the unbeliever. 
The unbeliever is obviously going to be weirded out because they don't believe that Jesus really rose from the dead to begin with. Almost everyone believes that Jesus died. All right, They believe he was a historical figure that died, that lived you know, first century, kind of talked this, kind of do unto others, we have them do unto you kind of stuff. So he died. What, obviously what unbelievers don't believe is they don't believe he raised from the dead. They're in for a big surprise. All right, When Jesus returns, they're going to realize not only did he raise from the dead, he has been waiting and everything he has said and everything he has promised is going to be fulfilled. I think it's also weird uh, for the Jewish person because it's going to reveal to them that sure enough, they missed their Messiah. Their Messiah did come. And all the prophecies of his return are coming. The millennial kingdom is coming. These were promises made to the Jewish people. And many of them rejected Jesus when he came. But I think it's also going to be weird for the Christian. I mean, any description I read on the end times is always weird. We always have more questions than we do answers. We're finally going to find out who's right. All right, when the end times finally actually do begin, we're going to realize who's right and who's wrong. L- let me rephrase. We're going to realize we were all wrong. <laughs> we're going to realize that we're like, oh, I did not have that right at all. Uh, I think we're going to really be surprised, and it's going to be weird. And it's going to be different. And any description I read, it's almost just how weird is it going to be, not whether or not it's going to be weird. But no matter what, as we kind of begin to dig into his description here, and obviously there's other descriptions and other parts of Scripture, but when we begin to look, I keep coming to the same realization, all that he's describing, the big picture. We're not going to look at the minutia this morning. That's where we can get into disagreements. The big picture is judgment. God's judgment is coming on the earth. All right? we. I think it's weird to us. We see so many things on the news and in this world and our everyday life that we look at and you're like, this isn't right, God. How are you allowing this to happen? Why would you allow this to happen? What? Why is there not a lightning bolt coming right now for that? Because this seems like it should be judged right here, right now. It's weird to us that God does not judge sin in the same way we would judge sin. But it's because God is filled with love his chesed, his loving kindness that he shows towards us. He is patient, so patient, far more patient than we would ever imagine. We want God to be patient with us. We don't want God to be patient with other people. Other people don't deserve it. We deserve patience. Other people don't deserve that, and he should punish now, all right? But he waits, and he waits, and he waits, but it's weird to us. I think we wonder, why is God not punishing them? But the answer is he is. They are being punished. They will be punished. And the ultimate judgment on the earth is coming. God is going to judge everyone and everything on this earth in his time. So let's begin to look at the different discussions that he kind of goes through three stories here of judgment. All right? And he's begin, he get, begins by talking about his second coming. But he has to talk about the thing he has to do first. Because again, remember in this discourse, we're in Luke 17. He has not died on the cross for his sins yet. But that's the first judgment that occurs. In Luke 17, 25, he says, But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Jesus faced the judgment that we are supposed to take. All right, he faced the judgment that we were supposed to experience. He took it for us on the cross. He says, that's why first thing that has to happen for all these judgments to take place, I got to be judged first. All right, I'm going to take on your judgment. I'm going to be rejected by this generation. I'm going to be accepted later. They don't have a choice. But this generation is going to reject me. Many of them are. A majority are. But I'm going to face their judgment anyway. Uh, I love fire. Um, I, I'm obsessed with fire. Like, just get me in a campfire. I just want to stare. I just want to stare at the fire. Uh, I loved burning stuff. I loved blowing up stuff. I love seeing what would burn and what wouldn't burn, how it would burn, what toxic fumes would come when I burn that. Love fire. Uh, and when I was out in San Diego, uh, a couple years ago, there was this huge amount of fires all over the place. So much so we were kind of in the northern part called Temecula. And you could smell the burning. It smelled like it was on fire. You couldn't see anything, but you could smell it just when the wind shifted the right way. And there's a big problem out there. It doesn't rain a whole lot. Everything's dry and everything burns up. 
And I think it's so interesting. And I mean, they fight fires lots of different ways. But one of the ways they fight fires is they'll see the direction that the fire is going. They'll get ahead of it. And they'll light the forest on fire. You're like, what? what? Yeah, they, they control burn it. So what they do is they, they lay it on fire and kind of keep it under control, make sure it doesn't get out of control. They burn it all so that <coughs> when the fire, when the wildfire reaches this area that they've already burned, there's nothing to burn up anymore. It's already been burned. All right, And there's a, a famous story of um, these settlers that were going out west and there was a huge fire. I mean, some people were saying it spread like over almost all of Missouri. Uh, in the early or early 1800s, I think it was the whole like Easter side was all on fire, and the, and so these um, these settlers had to go and they had to get on the other side of the river, but they knew the fire was big enough it would jump the river, and so what they started doing they started burning a big just a big area. There wasn't a whole bunch of people. They just burned this big area, and then they said, "Okay, guys, stay in this area." And they got in their tents. And they said, "Well, isn't the fire going to come?" And they said, "Listen, the fire has already burned this area. We have burned this area as the flames." roared towards them from the west. A little girl cried out in terror. And he says, are you sure we're not going to be burned up? And the leader said, my child, the flames cannot reach us here, for we are standing where the fire has already been. And when we think about what Jesus has done on the cross, what he really did is he took the burning that we deserve to be burned with. He took that judgment. He took that pain. And now he puts his arms out to us. He says, here, come to me. My area, I've already been burned. It can't be burned again. It's all consumed. Jesus took this for us. He took the penalty that we deserve to pay. He took the judgment that we deserve to be judged with. And we are in his presence. Fire can't touch us. Fire can't touch us. There's nothing for it to consume. His arms are around us, and he has already taken that for us. All right, And this is why he says, this is the, the, the progression. He says, I got to get judged first so I can create a safe place. So I can create a place of escape for my people. But this isn't the first time that God has brought escape to people. And he brings up a couple examples. The first example he brings up is that of Noah. He says, only the righteous escaped God's judgment from the flood. And he brings up this story, verse 26. And just as it happened in the days of Noah, so will it also be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and they were drinking and they were marrying. They were being given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And the flood came and destroyed them all. Noah spent years building the ark. And as they walked by him and as they interacted with him, the, their, their questions just turned to laughter. All right, They were going on with their life as regular. Noah's working day in and day out. No one could argue. Maybe they thought Noah was crazy, but they definitely knew Noah believed what he was saying because he was, he was putting his hard work where his mouth was. He was saying, listen, God is going to bring a flood and destroy the earth. And he then spends day after day after day building the ark. Everyone believed that Noah believed that God was going to bring that judgment. And they just watched and they ate and they drank and they were married and they married and given in marriage. They were just going on with their everyday life. But God rescued the righteous and his family was brought into the boat and they were saved. The next story he gives is only the chosen escape God's judgment of Sodom. And it gives the story here in verse 28. It was in the same as happened in the days of Lot. They were eating, they were drinking, they were buying, they were selling, they were planting, they were building. But on the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. It will just be the same on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. God tells Abraham, listen, I'm going to destroy the city of Sodom. And Abraham begs with him, begs him, says, don't do this. Don't. There's so many people that live in this city. Don't destroy them. And he says, why? They are worthy of judgment. They're worthy of destruction. He says, listen, if, there are, if, there, if we can find some righteous people, will you hold back your anger? And he says, oh, absolutely. And he says, listen, if there are 
50 people, if there are 50 people, you hold back your judgment. God's like, oh, definitely. If there are 50 people living in this giant city, I would hold back my judgment. And Abraham kind of realizes, like, I don't, I don't think I could find 50 people. What about, what about 20? He says, sure, 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 20 I, w- I would hold back. He gets all the way down to 10. If there are 10 righteous people, and God says, Abraham, Abraham, you know me. You know me. If there were 10 righteous people, I'd hold back my judgment. Next chapter, the judgment comes, because there aren't 10. And they go and they warn Lot to come quickly get out of here. All right, he has been living in the city. Ugh, Lot's a strange character because we get later on, I think it really helps us understand how good and gracious God is and that he is the one that declares people righteous because you don't see a single story about Lot that you're like, oh, wow, what a good guy. What a great, what a great young man that is. Every story about Lot is bad, and yet in the hall of faith there in Hebrews chapter 11, it declares Lot is righteous. Because God has declared him righteous. He'd been chosen. And God went to rescue his chosen people. All right? And he rescues Lot and his family and pulls them out of this, this city. And right when they get out, this judgment, this fire comes raining down. We see God's judgment occurring, but we see what God does. He wants to rescue his people. But we also know that the world will face God's judgment. He gives a specific story on this. He says, on that day, the one who is on the housetop and whose goods are in the house must not go down to take them. And likewise, the one who is in the field must must not turn back. Remember, remember Lot's wife. And what we're supposed to remember is that after he rescues them and they hear the fire come flying down from heaven, destroying the city, Lot's wife turns back and I always get the impression, like, looks longingly desires what the city of Sodom provided. Whatever sin she was engaged in, she missed that sin on a deep level and longed for it. And God, right there, turned her into a pillar of salt, judged her. The world, when you have worldly desires, and the thing we kind of going before this is just like, hey, if you know God's judgment is coming, If you know God's judgment is coming, we see what Noah did. He spends decades building an ark because he realized God's judgment was coming. You see Lot, even though not a lot of great stories about him, when he's told to go, judgment's coming, he goes. He doesn't grab anything else with him. He doesn't say, hold on, let me me get my petunias, let me fix them up. He says, no, he goes. Except Lot's wife. She looks back longingly and experiences the judgment that she should have escaped. When we think about our life, there are a lot of things we need to do. We we, we have to plant and sow. I mean, I know we don't do this really with, like, actual plants. We have to go to work and get a paycheck. All right? There are things we have to do, but let's never forget that judgment is coming. Is our life different because we know judgment's coming? Is our life different? If it's not... Who are we more like? Are we more like Noah or are we more like everybody else? If we know judgment is coming, are we more like Lot or are we more like everybody else? We've got to be careful. Now he speaks specifically to us, writing to the the hearers of this passage. All right? And what I want us to begin to uh, think about is before we get there in verse 33, I see this statement that is so common in our generation. This only God can judge me. Are you really hip, kids? That's Tupac. That's Tupac. Only God can judge me. I hear this a lot, and, I, and it's certainly transcended the hip-hop generation. I see it everywhere. People get it tattooed on themselves. Only God can judge me. People say that. You confront people, and you judge them. We were kind of talking about this in Sunday school this morning. We, we bring out, we, we, we talk to someone, we confront their sin, and their response is only God can judge me. But man, uh, there are two huge problems with the response of this not with the statement itself with the response all right and the first thing is people just really do not understand what that statement is actually meaning what it's intended to mean okay and and i think sometimes there are absolutely times where we confront poorly and and fb meyer gives great advice on how we can make sure we properly confront people on their sin and this is his quote i believe 
who once said that when we see a brother or sister in sin, there are two things we don't know. First, we don't know how hard he or she tried not to sin. All right, we see someone sin, the first thing we don't know, we don't know how hard they struggled with not doing that. The second thing we don't know is we don't know the power or the forces that assailed them. We also don't know what we would have done if in the same circumstance. So when we approach people, we understand, listen, I do not know how hard you've been fighting this. I don't know what I would do if I was in your exact same circumstance. And we come with that kind of humility. All right, absolutely. But if we are confronting people on visible sin, when it comes to judging, where Jesus talks about judge not lest you be judged, all right, what he's ultimately saying is, hey, who are you? Who are you to bring punishment on another person? Who are you in that particular day? I mean, you could point out things that people were breaking the law and send them to the Pharisees, and they could get, I mean, you could get lashings. You could get all kinds of, you'd have to go do washing. There were lots of consequences that could come. And he's saying, who are you to judge people? All right, now, in, in our context, I mean, we're never talking about, hey, we're judging people because you're going to come up and Pastor Joe's going to beat you. Pastor Joe is never going to beat you, okay? <laughs> I am never, you're never going to be like, all right, let me pull my belt off here. <laughs> you sinned because it's not my role to judge, all right? But when the response, and we certainly, I mean, I think the easier thing is we certainly aren't the ones that decide who goes to heaven and hell. Don't think that you have any power, no pastor, no priest. If I think, like, I don't think you're saved, that doesn't change the fact of whether you are saved or not, based on what I think. It doesn't matter. What I think does not change your eternity. But if I confront you with sin or someone else confronts you with sin, if your response is, hey, only God can judge me, what I actually think you're doing is, is you are rejecting the message of the Lord. You need to truly listen to what is being said. If it is from Scripture, if it is from God's Word, then it's not me saying it. It's not someone else here saying it. It's God saying it. It's God's Word. And if you are listening to this and looking and saying, you know what, the way you are confronting me and what is being said here, I disagree. Like, here's why. I think what I'm doing is okay. Here's biblically why I think it's fine. This is the example I think. I think you read into something. I, I think you misunderstood what I was doing or saying. Okay, well, that's a huge difference than just, I reject your confrontation. Only God can judge me. If our, if our rejection, if our use of only God can judge me is to reject people speaking truth in our lives, we're into some huge dangerous territory because ultimately when we look at why when if you really believe that God is going to judge you many of you should be very very scared you should be scared by the way you're living your life not because I see something or said something but because of what God's word says there should be the be fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom it's not the end of wisdom it's the beginning all right and we should absolutely care what God says. All right, and if and if we have this rejection of I don't want to ever be judged by anybody, nobody has a right to say anything for me. I, I can only speak for myself. I, I can come up with a pretty reasonable scenario that could be occurring. If I'm on my phone and texting, because I'm one of you guys texting me, so I have to text back. It's reasonable. And I am like I'm walking down the, you know, I'm walking down the road, and as I'm walking, you see me starting to head into the road. All right. And you see a car coming around the corner. And I'm not paying attention at all. I like peek up and I look to the right, but the car's coming from the other direction. And as I start walking into the street, I would be really offended if you said, hey, Joe, stop texting. You shouldn't be texting and walking. No. I want you to run up to me. Joe, you're about to die. You're about to get hit by a car because of that stupid phone. Look where you're going. Be careful. Your warning of me is, is because you love me. If our warning is out of love, you should constantly be warning. We see people texting themselves into oblivion. I'm not really worried about that. But we see people that they are literally heading into oncoming traffic by the way they live their life. They are, what they are doing, the sin they are objectively doing 
is heading down a road of destruction. They are playing Russian roulette, and they are going to die at some point. If you love them, you tell them. And if you don't care about them, you say nothing. That's why we have to keep saying things and keep going. And yeah, people might pull the, listen, you don't have the right to judge me. Agree with them. You're right. I don't have any right to judge you. I love you. I love you. And I believe this is what, if you respect who God is and what God has done, this is what God says in his word. I'm not judging you. If, you, if I'm pointing this out and you're saying I'm not doing that, okay. Okay, I might be wrong. I can be wrong. You know who isn't wrong? God's not wrong. If you are doing this, God knows. If you are doing this, this is a problem. And if you care about what God wants from your life, you'll change. And this is the advice he gives us. This is what he tells us. He says, the humble will escape God's judgment. Verse 33, he says this. Whoever seeks to keep his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, on that night there will be two in one bed. One will be taken, the other will be left. There will be two women grinding in the same place, and one will be taken, the other one will be left. Two men in the field, one will be taken, the other one will be left. <coughs> An answer, they said to him, Where, Lord? Where? Where are they going to be taken? And he said to them, Where the body is, there also the vultures will be gathered. Now, to point out two things in this passage, the opening part of it really gives this incredible revelation about God of what he really wants us to live our life. Those who want to keep their life. This is our natural, our flight or flight instinct, right? We have a natural instinct to survive, all right? We want to live, and I, I think we have a natural instinct to want to live eternally. Again, if we are presented with heaven and hell, every rational person says, yes, I would rather go to heaven than hell, okay? All right, because we have this desire to live, all right? We have this desire to not face pain and punishment, all right? And so God is giving us the cue, the clue here if you want to save your life, you have to be willing to lose it. Because if you are willing to lose your life, if you're willing to say, God, it's not my life anymore, I give it to you, you will preserve it. You will save it. He's giving us clue. If you want to save your life, be willing to lose it and give it to the Lord. And he tells us, here's the judgment that's coming. God's coming. One's going to be taken. One's going to be left. It's whoever is on God's list that is going to live. The, who God chooses, whom God rescues. And he tells us those who can be humble will be rescued. The righteous are going to be rescued. The chosen are going to be rescued. The humble are going to be rescued. All right, he's going to rescue us. That's the list you want to be on. Now, if I have to really, if you pin me down as I look, I'll give you one little minutia. When I look at this description here, it seems to me, just seems, that the description here is, to be taken is good, and to be left is bad. All right, and we see that with Noah and then Lot. Uh, we see that Noah, Lot, and then here in this description, one taken, one left, one will be taken, one will be left. It seems like the one that's going to be left is going to be the one whose body is there and the vultures are eating it. That doesn't seem positive. So I think this might actually be describing the rapture, that Jesus is coming to rescue some and is going to be leaving the rest for destruction. But can't be 100% sure. I lean that, obviously, I lean that way overall, and I lean that way in this passage. But the point of the passage remains the same. God's judgment is coming for everyone, all sinners, absolutely everyone. But, Joe, didn't, didn't we just bring up, we brought up in verse 25, but first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation, that Jesus came and died on the cross for our sins. So I don't face God's judgment, do I? No, but listen to what I'm saying. Everyone is going to be judged. Your name, when it comes up on God's list, everyone, because we're all sinners, has to be judged, 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 judged. What we want is for Christ to step in and say, yes, wait, I took his judgment. I took his judgment for him. He doesn't have to experience the judgment again. That would be double jeopardy, all right? He doesn't have to face it again. I faced it. Every name down that list is going to be judged. And it's whether or not you are going to face that judgment yourself or whether or not Christ took that judgment 
for you. Now, I know when we talk about the end times, right when I was like, oh, wow, we're going to talk about the end times today, everyone's like, yeah, can I get some details? And like, Joe, you didn't give me any details. And I said, no, I didn't give you any details. I know we have bigger questions. I know we're wondering what the end times are actually going to be like. He says that when we see the signs of the times, and we're going to know and this generation won't pass. What are the signs, Joe? And I said, yeah, the, the signs are kind to me when I read them. Are the signs happening today? Yeah, yeah, they, they seem to be happening. All right. Uh, did previous generations say that too? Yeah, they said that too. Because we're all supposed to, from the beginning of time, we should have all been, wow, God's judgment could come at any moment. And I still agree with that. His judgment could come at any moment. We want to ask questions of what the millennial kingdom is going to be like. This great promises of this, this kingdom that he's going to be setting on this earth. What's it going to be like? And I have way more questions than answers. If you even just want to talk about heaven, heaven is so vaguely described in Scripture. My statement would be, it's because heaven is so amazing, there aren't human words to describe it. So you, what are human writers supposed to say? Um, I'm going to, it's Akuna Matata? Uh, it's, it's incredible, like, how are we supposed to inscribe this place that is so much better than anything we could imagine? So I can't give you those details. But how did Jesus answer questions like this? Because he does. He does answer these questions. And the same, it seems like the same discourse occurring in John 14. He looks and he says, guys, don't, do not let your heart be troubled. Be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me, Jesus. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. But, but Thomas said to him, Lord, no, we, we don't know. We don't know where you are going. How do we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father in heaven but through me. What he's saying is, just, just, just give me Jesus. I, I, I don't know how the final days on earth are going to go. But I know I'll be with Jesus. And... I don't know what heaven is going to be like, but I know I'll be with Jesus. And however great heaven is, if Jesus wasn't there, I'd pick wherever Jesus was going to be at. Because wherever Jesus is at, it's going to be the best. And for all of hell's horrors, the worst part of it is that Jesus isn't there. You know, I don't know who's going to be elected president coming up here. But I know they won't be anywhere as good as Jesus and Noah went through the flood, and, no, and Lot went through the fire. And when we have to go through such things, I know Jesus will be there with me. He says, I will be with you always, even until the ends of the earth. So when we get into this final application, I wanted to give you something very hands-on, very like, what am I walking away with here, Joe? Give me something. All right, I got questions in my life. I'm asking questions like, what am I going to do for a living? And I'm asking questions like, is God going to heal me? And why did this happen to me? And what does he want, where does he want me to go? And who am I supposed to marry? And is this the right thing to do? I have questions. Joe, give me real application here. I said, all right, I can do that. Thomas asked Jesus, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? How do we know the way in all these life's questions that we have? And Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father in heaven except through me. So how do you get the answer to these very practical questions that we have? What, what am I going to do for a job? Who am I going to marry? Where am I supposed to go? Why is God not healing me? Where... What, what did I do wrong to deserve whatever it is that I'm going through? How do I know? All right, why, uh, 
you know, uh, what is the right thing to do in whatever situation you're struggling with right now? I, I can give you the answer to all these questions. The answer is you should do the exact same thing the disciples did. They sat down and they listened to Jesus. I started going through last night about, uh, I had some sleep issues, about 3 a.m. I was kind of, I, I kind of got this little, like, the application. The application is always the last thing I do because I'm always, you know, I sit and I'm going to always make sure I, I just dissect Scripture correctly and I'm digging through it, understanding it, and so then at the end, okay, if this is what God's Word is saying, how can we apply this to our life? So 3 a.m. in the morning, I, I just kind of like, you know what, what did the disciples do? They always sat down. So I started looking, I started in Matthew and started going through and started counting all the different times that it says that the disciples sat down and listened to Jesus, or Jesus sat with his disciples, or the crowd gathers and they sat together to listen to him speak. I started counting all those, and I fell asleep. There were that many. <laughs> Dozens of times the disciples sat down to listen to Jesus. But I think that's so important. I can say something objective here. You are busier than they were back then. Well, every statistic in the world shows the same thing, that we are getting busier and busier and more stressed and more stressed and fitting more into our day than we ever have before in the history of the world. They were so busy that they had to sit down to make sure they heard what Jesus was saying because they realized how valuable it was. Guys, it is so much more valuable to us to sit down. Sit down every day. Sit down and, and figure out what it is that Jesus is saying. Uh, I did 11 of the weird things that Jesus says uh, in the book of Luke. He says hundreds of things. Hundreds. This, this can't be the only place. You can't be coming on Sunday and expect, this is where I get fed from God's Word. You, you can't eat once a week and live. You are going to die of malnutrition. All right? You are going to end up in the hospital. All right? You need to sit down with Jesus every day. And, and I think you need to literally do it. It's so easy, like, oh, good, hey, listen, I can pop this, I can put it on audio while I'm driving in the car and doing this, and at my lunch break, I'll be eating and doing it. I'm just saying, a, a few minutes every day, crack open Luke and find something in red, and just read that a little bit every day. I'm telling you, all the questions that you start having in life, Jesus is going to start answering those questions, piece after piece, because he's the answer. He's the answer. And if you are asking a question in which he's not the answer, what happens is you start reading him, you start asking new questions so that you start getting to the right answer, Jesus. So if we can't start at a question standpoint, start at what Jesus is saying. Guys, it will change your life if you just read a paragraph a day. What you would learn from Jesus is mind-blowing. It's mind It might be stuff you've heard a million times. And that's what's so great about God's Word kind of being living and active. Yeah, you might have read it 15 years ago, but you're a different person today than you were 15 years ago. All right, And what you are going through right now, it might be answering something for you like, wow, I've been thinking about this all wrong. So sit down somewhere, somehow, whether it's at a lunch break, whether it's at the beginning of your day, waking up early like Jesus did, or maybe it's at the end of your day, whenever you can find that time to sit down just listen to Jesus. We are going to get to know so much about who he is and what's coming. All these little questions that we have on, well, how is this end time going to go down? I got to tell you, those questions start going away. Not always because we get more answers to those questions, but we start asking better questions. And we start seeing something much, much bigger that God is doing in our lives. Let's pray together. Jesus, impress upon us, starting today, to just take a moment and sit. Sit with you. Sit just like a little child would, crisscross applesauce, and just listen. Jesus, what can you tell me today? Is it something I need to hear again? Is it something I need to hear for the first time? 
but just listen to what you have to say in your word. After we read what's going on in your word, sit and listen to see if maybe your Holy Spirit is kind of guiding us, leading us to something as we begin to pray to you and ask for you to just speak to me, Lord. I pray this in this moment right now here, Lord. Lord, speak to me. I pray this for each person here. Lord, speak to me. And as the